maybe the first one is thank uh, Lingo for her a very honest and generous sharing this morning about, about her journey. Um, and I think that's incredibly important. I want to lift a couple of things which are so important for, for our conversation this morning. One of them is that I think what Lengwe brings to us this morning is the idea that um, it's hard. And I think that it's hard for me was in two different uh, uh, ways. The first one is that what you are trying to do is hard. The best sentence that I, I would want to echo is when Lengwe said, you're not going to pass a... Uh, 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 an undergraduate or a postgraduate and be asked to count chairs. And I think that's so important to appreciate is that what you're doing and what you are wanting to do is very, very difficult. And I think it's so important to appreciate that because now you can, you can know what is ahead of you, what is expected of you and what will be expected of you. This is not an easy game at all. And I'm not saying this at all to discourage you. Like Lenny was saying, it's in fact to prepare you and hopefully to encourage you. The second thing that I think Lenny brings this morning is the idea that, and it can be hard on you. And I think that having monitored, I mean, I've been in practice for, for more than a decade. I think that on the one hand, there's something so helpful about the, that mental health has become popular. It's on Twitter, it's on Instagram. You know, a lot of people are speaking about it. So what people do not speak enough of is that um, to do great things can take its toll on you. Um, black excellence does not come uh, without a lot of uh, a hard execution, actually. And I think that's so important also to appreciate. Now, the reason I also say that is not to scare you. I think to some extent it's to normalize and make it okay, the experiences that you shared in the chat box at the very beginning is to say it is hard and it will be hard on you and you're not the only one that's experiencing that. However, if it is that hard, what it might require of you is what I call a concomitant response, i.e. if what you're doing is difficult and it's hard on you, you need to also step up in order to make certain that you're going to be able to, to do that. And the stepping up oftentimes is academic. Though what I wanted to focus on a little bit is that the stepping up is to know that you cannot carry on with your life in the way that you did perhaps in high school or before. You really need to look after your health with the same amount of energy. You need to look after your mental and physical health with much more deliberateness than a person who's not doing what you're doing, actually. Taking it seriously and um, being as attentive and being as deliberate about it is one of the things that will uh, give you a shot at getting through it and getting through it intact. So I wanted to thank you for, for, for bringing that. And, and maybe one last thing is to say, and there's no shame in struggling. And I think you ended by sharing very personally and saying, look, I struggled. I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder after trying um, um, to push myself. And I think it takes a brave person to say that, though I think you speak on behalf of millions of people and maybe um, hundreds of, of students uh, on the call this morning um, to say, listen, listen to the signs and symptoms before they really stop you dead in their tracks. Um, I, have not, uh, I have not prepared anything on, on depression and anxiety this morning. However, I think what Lengwe brings is so important is that you know, the depression and anxiety amongst very many other difficulties will whisper to you, you're not okay, you're not okay, you're not okay. And if you struggle to listen to that, then they'll start to speak louder, you're really not okay. And if you struggle to listen to that, then they'll really shout and stop you dead in the tracks. And that is when you collapse. That is when you cannot get up in the morning. That is when things are not making sense, so on and so forth. So hopefully you can be encouraged by the general sharing this morning to say, listen to uh, 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 your body, your psychology telling you that you're not okay. Um, and that will give you a great shot, in fact, at, at being able to deal with it. The second thing that I wanted to say is, I mean, the conversation that I've prepared is based on some of the information that Manusi shared with me um, to say, this is what some students were struggling with. And um, um, as a result, in fact, taking my mandate from him, I want to speak about trauma. 
Um, I'm not going to speak necessarily about depression or anxiety, even though I'm able to do that. And if we have some time, I'll share some, some of that, some of those notes. So it, from what I read, it seemed like a lot of people this morning are struggling uh, with some forms of trauma. And I wanted then to help us understand what it is, why it is, and maybe at the end to also give some, um, some of the things that some of you will be familiar with. The conversation is not easy, it's not light, and um, there may be some triggers for, for some of you. It does occur to me that the, the foundation has assured me that it does have services available for a lot of people. Um, so if it is that you're finding that what I'm speaking about is hard, or you can see it in yourself, in a friend, in a colleague, in a family member, um, I'm assured that you can reach out to, to the foundation uh, in order to say that this was, this was hard, this was triggering, this felt familiar, I identified with this, that, and the other, um, and you will be assisted from there. So even though it might be hard, what I'm about to say, hopefully it will bring you relief to say, oh, there's a name for it. Um, and hopefully it will bring you relief in knowing that there's something that can be done uh, about it. So in fact, I will share my screen if my computer cooperates and then, uh, sorry, it's just refusing. Okay, let's see. I'm also very happy also because of time to say that if at any point you want to raise your hand or actually you can unmute, I'm very happy for you to, to just unmute and, and, and interrupt me um, and to, to have a bit of a conversation uh, rather than, than a lecture. Um, the reason I'm, I'm presenting on trauma, as I said, is because from what I got from Malusi, we, we had a sense that a lot of people are traumatized and do not know it or have experienced trauma and do not know it. And I can assure you that this will be one of the biggest um, stumbling blocks to you achieving what you need to achieve. So I want to give you a shot at achieving what you need to achieve by saying, if you're struggling with this, um, and this is how you're struggling with it, this is what you can do. Okay. So let's go through it. You know, I'm not going to uh, speak a lot of, of the definitions, though I thought it is important to say that a lot of people say, what is trauma, you know, um, um, and, and South Africans say that a lot more because in fact, we live with trauma all around us. So it can become very difficult to know what it is and what it is not. And really, I think I, I penned an article many years ago around how we live in the most traumatic society and the most traumatizing. Though particularly a traumatic experience is an event in life that causes a threat to our safety and potential places and, and potentially places our own life or lives of others at risk. As a result, the person experiences high levels of emotional, psychological, and physical distress that temporarily disrupt their ability to function in the normal day-to-day -day life. If I go back to the first sentence, if we think about the South Africa that we all live in, that most of us grew in, the sad region that most of us were born into, and the African continent that we're on, the idea of threat to life or, or, or threat to other people's lives feels like it's always around the corner. So we can take for granted that most of us are actually familiar with, with some sort of trauma. Now, the response to it, you know, as, as I think is very important to say, is uh, it is a normal to have a strong emotional or physical reaction following a distressing event. And um, on most occasions, though, these reactions, they, they die down, they subside, and they disappear as part of the body's natural healing and recovery process. And I wanted to, to describe that. So I've said most of us have experienced trauma, and all of us will have what is a normal heightened response to it, which is emotional, physical, and psychological. Now, the reason that your body does that is, in fact, to protect you, because we are at um, the core of ourselves quite animalistic. We like animals. And that animal part of us, which is from anyway, is still in our brains, says that if we feel like we're in danger, actually our body wants to prepare us for that. And a lot of people will be familiar with the idea of um, flight or fright or freeze, right? It prepares us in order to respond, in order to um, best deal with the situation in front of us. 
So that response is good, right? Um, if you hear a loud bang, actually your pupils become a lot more sharp and focused. Your hearing does too. Um, your, your heart starts to pump a lot more uh, blood, especially to your um, extremities in order to, to get you active because it anticipates that there's danger that's going on there. Usually that subsides. You know, you get a shot of adrenaline and that goes down. Your cortisol levels rise up in order to increase your focus and that goes down, so on and so forth. However, certain traumas can be so significant that that does not subside. And it becomes then as if you are consistently living in situations of danger or the danger has left a big mark or scar on your psychology. Now, if the scar was on your um, um, hands or you know, whatever the case is, we'd be able to see it. However, if it is inside, it becomes incredibly difficult to see. People ask me, um, how do you then distinguish between that this is a bad trauma or this will be fine? And I think the idea of the three E's is very helpful, is that you know, it depends on the event or the series of events, right? Um, and it also depends on how you experience it, actually, as an individual. Two people may see the same car crash or the same uh, violence and not have the same effect. And that's the third E, listening to the effect that it has had on you. So to think a bit about the event, how you experienced it, and what effect has it left on you? I also, and I'm speaking very fast because I want to leave some time for us to, to really have a group discussion. I wanted to bring to you six common traumas that I find, um, um, especially in the young adolescent population, young adult population of, of South Africa, and that's mostly like 24 to 44, uh, which is a space I work in, in, in a lot um, in South Africa. And, and actually, I mean, I, I, I extend it to, to SADEG, the, the, the SADEG region of Africa. The first one is gang-related violence. The second one is school violence. And, and I mean, you just have to look at our media in South Africa to know about how um, many people, maybe even on this talk this morning, would have experienced some degree of, of school violence. The third one is family trauma, which a lot of people are also familiar with. I thought it was also incredibly uh, important, and, I, and I'll go to a hand in a second, to, um, to mention refugee and immigrant trauma. And I'll pause here for a second because I think the idea of uh, migration and immigration is, is so familiar in the South African uh, context. Historically, it's something very familiar, but I think in the very contemporary, it's also very familiar. And, and we, would, we were all shocked, or rather I was, I was thinking to myself, People are responding a lot to um, Ukrainians fleeing Ukraine and going to neighboring countries. Though this happens in Af on the African continent on a daily basis, and even in South Africa on a daily basis. And it's a pity we do not have the same response because it is in fact incredibly traumatic, not only to be the person that's moving around. And by the way, I even refer to interprovincial moving around because you're having to leave a place and space that you're familiar with, go to another one and find yourself comfortable and um, um, settle in and so on and so forth. And it's not always the case that that transition is a comfortable one. Medical traumas, a lot of people would have experienced. And in fact, believe it or not, to be in poverty is traumatic, actually. And, and, and there are absolute physical responses that, that we know come from that. So I'm not gonna go into, into a lot of detail further. Um, I saw there was a hand up. I, I, I'm, I want to invite you to just unmute and, and start speaking. I'm gonna pause for a second. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna have to take you back a little bit. So on the, on the um, concept of effect, um, the trauma effect as it, is it what it triggers? Is it what the event triggers or what is it? Can you please just elaborate on that? Sure. So what I'll speak about in a second, and maybe I should move towards that, is what effects do we see usually? How does this show itself? How do you know you've been affected by it? And I'm going to give you a, a list which is not 
exhaustive. It's not everything. Um, but these are oftentimes the effects, the responses um, of what trauma can look like on a person and inside of a person. Um, and so I'm going to come to this in, in, in or oh, maybe let me, let me kind of speak through it now. These are the effects of it. And the effects of it are, you can experience these, um, um, so, so to speak, symptoms after a trauma or something happens, and I know the word trigger is, is used a lot these days, something happens to trigger the, the, the trauma and then you find yourself feeling uh, frightened, anxious, worried, concerned um, about, about others, feeling a lot of shame, guilt, taking responsibility for things that you couldn't take responsibility for. And I'll give you an example with that. You know, um, um, the thing about a trauma is that oftentimes you might imagine, if only I had not, which is a symptom actually of the effect of trauma, because in fact, you could not have done anything about it. Withdrawing from family, peers and activities, classrooms, um, avoiding uh, reminders of events because it feels impossible to go there or just impossible to get up more intense mood swings, decline in school performance, an increase in risk-taking behaviors such as alcohol, drug use, abuse, sexual behaviors, um, and um, fights or aggression, as well as self-harm. Um, uh, yeah. So those are oftentimes how the, the trauma shows itself, the effect of the trauma shows itself um, in and on individuals. I don't know if you want to ask a follow-up question on that. No, 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 thank you. Uh, that was clear. Yeah. As I said, it can be quite hard, I think, to listen to this for some people because you might be able to recognize that, wait, wait, I didn't know that this, that, or the other happened to me. Though now that I look at this list, I can tell that maybe it's affected me. And I'm, I'm putting it to you that this is a good thing that you can recognize this because now there's some help or that, that you can... Um, begin to to look for and and get and now you can put a name to what it is i also thought for our population this morning or, or our group this morning it's important to mention historical traumas actually and this is um an idea by maria yellow um horse braveheart who speaks about um, historical traumas as the cumulative emotional and psychological uh, wounding across generations including the lifespan which emanates from massive groups of trauma um, and they've done studies in, in, in North America, um, they've, uh, quite a few studies in um, Europe um, and in, anyway, in, in the Middle East um, and in Asia. Um, uh, and it's such a pity that there aren't enough studies in Africa. And from here on out, you can start to hear that there must be a trauma from the South African historical background, actually, that a lot of people are carrying. And it's also so incredibly important, um, I think, to speak about uh, the queer community's experience of trauma. South Africa has one of the most progressive constitutional um, uh, approaches to the queer community. However, on the ground, in fact, there's still a lot of um, traumatic events um, that, that queer people experience. As, and I've spoken a little bit about um, um, racial trauma as well. So I wanted to say something here, which is to say there's something incredibly helpful about the advent of social media. We can connect in seconds and we can connect very far. However, what it does, for example, when we see um, um, George Floyd, is that it opens us up actually also to be traumatized. So what a lot of people, and you know, if we're in a room, I'll say, put your hand up if you felt a, a deep response to watching the George Floyd video. And I suspect a lot of people would put their hands up. One of the reasons you had such a response was that it was incredibly traumatic actually. To witness racial violence towards others is incredibly traumatic. Clinton, do you want to speak? Um, sorry. Uh, I think personally, uh, it was it was very very traumatic, and given that um, as we watched it, it seems like they tried to at least engage with the police guys, but uh, George Floyd didn't get adequate assistance, 
uh, even they tried to, to, to intervene, they didn't act accordingly to assist him. So at some point, uh, I don't want to um, rationalize this, but personally, even though it was someone from different race, it was going to be really, really traumatic. Thank you. Yeah, it really was, you know. And, and I think that I'm, I'm saying two things here. The first one is even to watch something can be traumatic. And, and really this then speaks to another talk that I do around um, really protecting and, and being very deliberate about what you consume. Because I think that the, you know, as I say, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, the news, it, it makes you able to consume so much with a buffet of options. However, um, you, are, you, you really need to be careful how you consume what you consume, really being able to pick what it is that you're going to let into um, um, your mind, because it can be incredibly traumatic. And this is uh, over and above, for example, racial trauma. What I have not included is, um, um, well, you, you know, you, we can substitute this for a lot, queer trauma, um, gender-based trauma, you know, again, um, the, what, what a lot of South Africans would not have known is that it was traumatic to find out about the deaths of um, very many young females in the last many years. It's traumatic. And a lot of people would, would have had that response. Mbali, do you want to, to speak very quickly and then I'll, I'll go on? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, you've touched on, while we're on the trauma, and you've touched on the subject of migration. And uh, okay, I can hear you talking about the, the, the Floyd incidents in America, but I want to touch base on what's happening closer at home, especially what is happening with this operation to Dula. You know, I think for me, it's very traumatic to see a human being being treated in the, in the manner that we are treating our fellow brothers and sisters all across the African continent. There's a whole lot of historical effects that are playing in here. Uh, we all know where we are coming from and how we were treated during those days of apartheid. We had to flee, our parents had to flee uh, across the continent and we were well accepted. We were well accommodated. Yes, we've got problems. We've got, uh, you know, um, employment issues. We've got social issues. Yes, um, they are undocumented uh, brothers and sisters who are living among masters. Yes, there is a problem, Mama Way. But however, it is very traumatic for us coming from where we are coming from and being accommodated the way we were accommodated. I mean, there were governments across the continent that were finding, they were found funding our political missions you know, based on their monies. And, and they didn't have to do all of that. They've trained us, they schooled us, they, they, they accommodated us, they skilled us. But yeah. is, this, is this how we are? Is this how we are uh, repaying back, basically? So for me, this whole thing is very traumatic, uh, I'm I think afraid. It, it really uh, is. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. And I mean, I think it's an incredibly important point because it is um, a very traumatic to, to be reminded, actually, um, of, of a time where, uh, um, you know, there was a lot of displacement in South Africa and for South Africans. I think it's also just traumatic to see a lot of what's going on. And I think that it's also traumatic for people on the other side, actually, to, to have to go through this. And you can see why I've, I've really kind of tried to look at trauma today, because I think that there's a lot of trauma that we're, we're, we're sitting with and around, which is not um, spoken about uh, uh, enough. A lot of, and maybe I'm moving on a bit too fast. So, you know, as I said, I want to leave enough time for us to, to have a conversation. What I would then typically do at this point is speak about the two different responses to trauma one which is adaptive and the other which is maladaptive. So the maladaptive one is, remember those symptoms and signs that I was speaking to you about, um, is when they kind of um, show themselves and the individual doesn't listen to them or, or look at them or attend to them. And what they can do 
is that they can then cause a lot more distress, severe persisting distress after a traumatic event. And that's a body's attempt to try and adjust, um, which is not effective, trying to cope with that, which is not effective. And it can lead to um, needing a lot more intensive individualized support. So if I help track us back, a little bit earlier I said, a trauma response may be ordinary. It's dependent on the three E's. It may be ordinary. Um, if it is, if it shows itself in these ways and not treated, not listened to by you, the individual, not attended to, not paid attention to, it leads to these maladaptive um, um, responses and severe distress, which makes it even harder to treat in the future. It does not have to, and then later I will think a bit, in fact, I'll say it now. And at this point, this is when you need an expert, uh, a, a professional to help you through this. There's also nothing wrong, by the way, to have severe distress. However, trauma does not have to be all bad. You know, going through difficult um, situations as uh, uh, we heard this morning, in fact, can be building, and I'll speak about it in two, in three different ways, in four actually, it's resilience, recovery, and growth. So resilience, which is underappreciated, is a, actually a positive adaptive response to a significant adversity. And, you know, to the extent that I'm speaking to university students or university or students in, in higher um, education, you've done it. The difficulties of having to learn and be assessed or examined actually has built your resilience, right? And that's quite a benign or um, a less traumatic um, situation to, to build resilience. But you will know for yourself of very many other times where you built resilience from something that was difficult and hard. It is when, in fact, there's a adaptable, caring and supportive relationships um, with an adult and adults, a sense of mastery of, you know, actually I had this um, difficulty, so I've been able to master it. And should I face it again, I'll be better at facing it and, and coming out of it. A strong executive functioning and self-regulation, really what that means is thinking about it, making sense of it actually, without getting too distressed or needing um, to do those distraction things that I was speaking about a little bit earlier. Safe, supportive environments around you, and affirming um, faith, whatever your, your, your kind of religious uh, and cultural beliefs. So oftentimes people say, what are the, what are the things that we can do to try and, and protect ourselves from being um, over-traumatized by this? And these are them as well. Trying to have good relationships around you, um, finding a way to master, uh, uh, um, to, to find mastery after a very difficult event, really actually looking to what has happened as opposed to looking away and distracting yourself and trying to foster and um, finding even very supportive environments. And if it, is, um, your, if it is your thing to rely in fact on your religious and cultural traditions. Um, I mean, this is a little bit more on post-traumatic growth, which says that Positive change, or it is positive change or transformation as a result of a traumatic um, event. I also very briefly and in a very clumsy way wanted to speak about anti-fragility. So we've got, we have these three previous um, categories, resilience, recovery, and growth. And I wanted to briefly introduce you to an idea of anti-fragility, which describes a category of things that um, not only gain from chaos, however, may need a little, uh, may need it to survive or flourish. Anti-fragility goes beyond being robust. It means that something does not merely withstand a shock. However, it improves um, because of it. And, and this is just one more slide and then I'll speak to it directly, which is some things benefit from shocks actually. And, and you are all those things, by the way. They thrive and grow when exposed to volatility, randomness, disorder, stress, and, um, and they love adventure, risks and uncertainty. Anti-fragility is beyond resilience or robustness. Um, the, the resilient resist shocks and they stay the same and anti-fragility gets better. And there are two ways to actually speak about anti-fragility in, in concrete ways. One of them is if you um, exert your body in physical activity, like go to gym or go for a run, 
if your body was fragile or robust, right, it would not be able to tear because it's experienced something that is um, um, really, it's experienced an ex exertion. It, the muscle tears, so it allows itself to feel the, the shock. And then overnight, it rebuilds bigger and better. And then it tears and rebuilds bigger and better. Or um, um, it's actually, I mean, vi viruses are very topical at the moment. The thing about your body is that it shows that to fragility. It can experience a virus coming into it. It knows that it's not okay. And that's why you have the symptoms and it slows you down. However, it listens to what has happened and recodes itself to create an immune response. So it's not as though your body doesn't want to ever experience difficulties. It's that it's going to learn from those difficulties. Okay. And that's, that's the, the nutshell of antifragility. I also wanted to present to you, I think about five um, coping uh, 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 mechanisms that you can have for traumatic stress. And let me pause here. I, you know, I, I had a, I took issue with uh, Malu said, I hope it's okay, but if I say this, because I said to him, we can't just speak about uh, mental health in, in, in 40 minutes. We can't speak, of, I can't, give you coping mechanisms. This is what, you know, people go to university for seven to 10 years to learn. However, I will tell you what it is that you can do. And when over and above this, something is still not okay, then you must absolutely present yourself to a professional. The first one, as I've said before, is being able to lean on loved ones, identifying friends and family members that can support you and identifying those that will not give you the support that you need. And I really, I, I want to re-say that sentence in such bold letters, it's so important to also identify those that will not be able to give you the help that you need at the time. Um, face your feelings, actually. I think a lot of people can want to look away and avoid. However, it's normal to want to avoid. We know that thinking about the traumatic event, we know that instead, not leaving the house, sleeping all the time, isolating yourself from your loved ones and using substances to escape, um, to escape the reminders are not healthy ways to cope over time. Um, though avoiding is normal, too much of it can prolong your stress and keep you from healing. Gradually uh, try to ease back into normal routine and, um, and look for support from loved ones or a mental health professional and, and really a professional. And, and that can help you um, get back into your groove. Prioritize your self-care. I think a lot of people will be familiar with, um, and I'm not gonna go through it, except to say a lot of people do not even know what, what their self-care is over and above what Issa Rae might say on Insecure. And she's right, but you must know what your self-care is and looks like. Also remember to be patient, because as I said, it's normal to have a strong reaction to a distress event. Take things one day at a time um, as you recover. Um, and as the day passes, your symptoms should start to gradually improve. I want to open it up now for us to have a conversation in the seven minutes that we have left. So again, I want to kind of invite people to unmute or put your hand up and, and um, let's discuss if, if, if there's something that um, you wanted to bring up. Thanks, Mr. Mzamo. There, is, there was a question, or there is still a question from Kosana in the chat room. Maybe we can start with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, let me have a look. I mean, I'm not certain what, what um, you would be referring to uh, and Kosana around spiritual trauma. The question is, is there such a thing as called spiritual trauma? I'm not certain what you would refer to though. I mean, I think it's so important to, to go back to what it was that I was saying earlier around the three E's. You know, if it is an, a spiritual event that you experience um, that has adverse effects, then yes, I can imagine that there can be um, spiritual traumas as well. So what I do want to say to your question is that maybe it's allowing you to recognize an event as traumatic that previously was just categorized as spiritual. Gosana, do you maybe Wait, want to thank you, thank you, you might have said that? So. 
Hello, can you hear me? Go for yes, it. we can hear you, Gosana. Go for it. Okay, sure. No, it's just something that uh, came to mind. You know what I mean? So, obviously, considering the fact that we are spiritual beings and, you know, some people might go through spiritual events. Uh, uh, I can't think of an example now. It's just something, like I said, uh, that came to mind. Yes, yeah. I think, I mean, as I say, I, I can imagine that um, um, certain spiritual events can, in fact, be experienced by an individual as traumatic. I see there's a comment. Um, feels like I fell into a trap. Yeah. And, and thanks for that comment, Luan, and, and again, yourself for sharing. I do want to say that at UCT, um, I mean, I think uh, Amalusu was sharing that I'm, 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 I'm the vice chair of SEDEG, and we have a helpline, in fact, at UCT that you can reach out to. Um, and, and have a conversation with a counselor over the phone who will be able to then direct you to, to somebody else. Um, UCT also has a very brilliant um, student. Well, look, you know, I say brilliant because of, anyway, uh, a, a student wellness center that, that can be um, attended to. And I think that the, the most important thing from what you say from this side is that, wait, hold on, actually, Maybe I need to attend to this and um, um, do something about it. So, so all the best, um, Libon. Um, thank you. Putim Zama, you also mentioned something about poverty um, that also can be traumatic, but I don't think you got much to speak about it. Can you maybe elaborate on that? And there was an issue around access to resources, networks, and so forth, which is, I think, many of us do experience that. Thank you. Yeah, if we had an hour, I'd, I'd elaborate on my poverty is, is traumatic, you know, because it's such a big and important thing. So I think that, let me put it like this, right? I think the state of poverty oftentimes leaves people having to be in survival mode and nobody should have to be in survival mode, actually. And to consistently be needing to think how to stay alive, when I put it in those words, I think you can imagine is actually incredibly a traumatic let alone what poverty exposes you to in trauma. The trauma around a lot of our impoverished uh, uh, communities as well. I want to allow um, Lengwet, who's raised her hand to speak and then we'll, we'll probably close after that. Um, please go for it, Lengwet. It's a very quick question to you, uh, Putzam. And um, here, I wanna ask a question for myself, um, as someone who does research on impoverished communities, but also maybe for some of the colleagues and students here on the platform in terms of our different coping mechanisms and different ways um, of therapy that we've thought of. Um, and I'm raising this uh, you know, point because one of the things that I had to struggle with when I was going out to do my research had to do with um, um, the university and the ethics committee wanting me to offer ways in which uh, I'm going to address because I was, uh, I was researching questions of trauma, questions of apartheid violence and all of that. So they wanted me to offer ways in which I'm going to make sure that my participants are okay after after I, I, I forced them to go back to the site of violence, to the site of trauma that might have happened in the 70s, 80s. But then uh, one of the arguments that I was making is that different ways of healing, um, especially for African communities. And I was drawing this from one participant who told me a very gruesome story, a very detailed, you know, graphic story of violence. And then uh, she said to me at the end of the, of the interview. For the past 29 years, I haven't told this story to anyone ever because these are things that we do not talk about. But today I feel like I'm going to sleep for the first time because I feel like a rock has been lifted um, off my shoulders. And then what that meant for me, um, having to listen to that story, taking the trauma, carrying the trauma to me and her saying she's going to sleep for the first time. So I just want you to quickly, um, if you can, of course, 
uh, reflect on different ways of uh, dealing with trauma or healing that are available um, for us um, as people in the academic space or any other persons um, for that matter. Thank you. Yeah, maybe what I'll say is that it, it does sound like what that individual describes is that speaking about it was actually the, the therapeutic part that they experienced the ability to go through it with somebody to make sense of something that had not made sense for the longest time with someone and having you witness it, that that was what was therapeutic. Now, we know that um, counseling and psychotherapy are in fact very um, um, helpful in dealing with a trauma. Um, it is one of very many ways of dealing with a trauma. We have ways that do not re, uh, rely on professionals going to shul, going to church, going to mosque, um, and going to, to friends and family, actually, and finding comfort in many ways. Um, and those are helpful. Sometimes they're not enough and they need a professional in the very same way as if you have a bruise or a scar on your hand, you can treat it at home. And sometimes it's actually too big and too much and you need a professional to help treat it. And that's where you would reach out for, with, for somebody. I also wanted to say that some people though do present with ways of dealing and coping with things that are not helpful. So um, of course we would encourage people and would want to know how is it that you deal with it? Um, though we would also want to caution people who perhaps do not deal with things in ways that are progressive or like really allow them to keep going and are not destructive um, for themselves and those around them. Um, yeah. I want to say thank you once again to, to um, Manusi and the team for organizing this and for inviting me, to um, everybody who was present here this, this morning. And um, I want to wish you all of the best as I say goodbye. Okay. Thanks, uh, but one last thing before you, you dash out, um, maybe around then how then do we support those who are around us that we might see that they are going through something, but maybe they have not recognized it, or maybe they have already recognized it, but we don't know how to maybe kind of offer help, or sometimes, you know, naturally want to help, but sometimes even what you offer can also be dangerous in a way. And also we don't know what to say. It could be make things worse. Maybe if you can just close with on, on that note. Thank you. Yeah. I have one, I've, because I have a minute and I really do have a hot stop, I'll say that I think it's important to remain as supportive as possible. And one way to do that is actually to ask the person what it is that they might need, actually. Um, and oftentimes people listen to respond and not just listen, comma, and in fact, actually ask the person what it is that they might need in this moment. And then further, for you and the person to know that you may need to involve uh, um, um, another person and that other person is oftentimes uh, a professional. So the first thing is through being supportive is really listening to where the person's at and finding out what they may need, what they may find supportive. And the second one is knowing when you need to escalate that support. Um, in the same way as if a person is having an asthma attack, for me to say, it's okay, it's okay, it's not just going to be helpful. I may need, in fact, to get them to, to a hospital um, and to know when you need to escalate that, yeah. Cool. Thank you very much, Putzamo. This is- All right. Wonderful. Yeah, cool. You. I'm very glad to hear that. And, and, and goodbye, everybody. And as I said, um, all of the very best um, for the future. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, as we are about to close now, uh, maybe if you can just react to Budim Zamo's um, presentation in the chat room or use an emoji, maybe how are you feeling now? How did you experience the session? So this is the time to do that. Um, so one of another thing that I would like to mention is that as the foundation, we work with the counseling hub. Um, they are in Woodstock, so we have a relationship with them. So if any of you here on this call would like actually to seek help, you are looking to for counseling or you want to do talk therapy, there is a number that I've posted in the chat room, but of course, maybe Fadila or Snete Maluko is going to email the number to everyone so that you have it uh, close to you. So you can phone in and say, I am a HCI Foundation student and I would like to make a booking to speak to someone. 
then they're going to arrange um, time for you. It is done telephonically, so it doesn't matter whether you're in Free State or Johannesburg, then you can just make a booking, then a counselor is going to engage with you. There will be a minimum six sessions that you'll be engaged on. Um, and then of course they will see from those sessions whether maybe you need more help and stuff like that. But the number is in the chat room, it is 021-462-3902. But of course, if you don't get the number now, we'll email the number to you so that you can ask for help when you need help. As Jamala has said, if you need help on anything, we are here, we'll help where we can. If you're struggling, you have challenges, just uh, be in touch with us. And also then we'll see then how we can help with other guards. And before I dish out, I hand over to Fadila to close it off. Thank you very much for participating in this session. And also thank you very much for the time you spent with us when we did the interviews. It was quite insightful to engage with you, uh, to do interviews with you. And also actually this session was also designed based on what came up in the interviews and also then in the essays that you wrote to us. So we are really appreciative of the time that we have taken. And also we hope that you will do well also throughout this year and you will reach out anytime you need help and also you'll participate in the mentorship program. So from my side, thank you very much. I uh, hope to engage with you soon. Maybe before I get hand over to Fatila, I see Gosana has a hand up. Gosana, do you want to come in? And then after Gosana, Fatila, you can just jump in. I, I won't come there. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes, Melissa, thank you. Um, I saw on the chat box, um, maybe this was spoken about earlier on with regards to the allocation of mentor, mentors. Uh, rather. Um, I saw that some students are supposedly have been allocated uh, mentors and that will be communicated to them uh, via email. Um, I, I also heard that uh, there's limited resources with regards to mentors. Is that is that the case or is it something you guys are going to work on so that everyone is uh, fairly accommodated in, in that regard? So Malusi, maybe I can answer that. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fadila. Um, I and Kusana, we want to place about a hundred um, mentees with mentors. That is our aim, and we have we we busy in uh, with the process of pairing um, a mentee with an appropriate mentor. And as you see in the chat box, there are various things that we look at. We want, because people can now meet face-to-face, -face, we want them to preferably be in the same geographical location, um, also the same field of interest and um, whatever the expertise is of the mentor, whether they can guide um, the young people to reach their full potential. So unfortunately, not all of our students will get a mentor. And um, we basically have a look at um, who, um, who is available and the areas of expertise that um, will be matched with the students. Um, but if you don't have a mentor, all is not lost because the whole of the HCI Foundation team, we will um, be able to assist you. You can always email us, you can call us, and then we will try our best to help you with whatever you are going through. So I am going to finish now. We are over time. I want to thank all of the students for attending today. You, We appreciate your time. We know that you have maybe canceled some other engagement for you to be here. We appreciate you. Thank you so much. I want to Thank uh, Dr. Klingiwe Nklovu, Sis Klingiwe, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I, I'm sure that your words will stay with our students um, for a very, very long time. Also, Dr. Zamambele, uh, such insight, such um, clarity on what we may not even being aware that we are experiencing and also the tools on how to cope with it. I think um, uh, the, the counseling hub um, information, please make a note of those uh, all students so that you know where to go to. And what I just want to highlight is 
Um, if you, uh, what Jamala said um, at the beginning, and thank you Jamala for such a lovely overview of what the program is about. Remember that if you are assigned a mentor, be proactive, take the initiative and be committed to this relationship. It is not going to take out a lot of the time out of your busy schedule. We basically need a minimum of one contact per month. But obviously, if you have built up a good relationship, it can be more than that. Then secondly, if you are experiencing troubles, if you're experiencing challenges, let us know about it. We are not promising to do anything, but maybe just having someone to listen to you would also help. So with that, thank you to Sinetemba and Malusi and um, Jamala for this wonderful experience and first meet up with our students. And to all of you, um, enjoy your studies, enjoy it. Don't think of it as negative. Think of it as a stepping stone to a lovely and wonderful future. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fadila. Um, so everyone, I hope you are following us on Facebook, on LinkedIn, and also on Twitter. Um, so what we're going to do now, we'd like to take a screenshot um, of the session. If you can just all, if you are comfortable, open your videos, then Jamala is going to take a picture um, of the screen. Uh, again, lastly, please do follow us on our social media platforms. We'd like to keep in touch with you. Also good to see the faces that we spoke with during interviews. I see Jordan is here um, and others that we spoke with during interviews. And just to say, while Jamala is getting ready to take the picture, um, do you know that actually we started to speak with Sis Kleng you in January already um, in preparation for the workshop, same as also with Kutuzamu, already in January, like, hey, cool, we need to have this workshop um, in March, but now we need to get the best speakers um, for this session. And I'll follow the grateful to Sis Kleng you for making time to engage with us. We first had her speak actually on a Twitter space um, on the Rivonia cycle. She was also a contributor in that session. And of course, Putum Zamo does Azam speaking to like a lot of things like on radio and also runs like there as a deputy chair of SEDEC. So he does a lot of engagements around things. So also students, if you have any questions for us, feel free to write to us. You have suggestions, you have some ideas, feel free to engage with us. We are open. Um, I'm just waiting to hear from Jamala if um, he's ready to take the picture. Yeah, and then Malusi, Mal Mal I'm taking. Let me see how it comes. I think just okay, cool. patient. Sinetembo on your side, try as well and see if it will come right. We've got a lot of people on the call, so trying to get as many people <laughs> as possible. Yeah, while it does, can we just say wushi? You remember <laughs> that wushi? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, back in the day, there was a wishy thing. Um, yeah, so you can just do any reaction and... So uh, I'm trying as point. much as I can to take the to take print screen, but again, it's a lot of people, so we may not have everyone. No, that will be fine. At least you are not ghosting you yet. You are still on the call. <laughs> okay, Malusi. I think we can we can yes, work with we, we can work with it. It's, it's fine. Thank you. Yes, Tandega is already busy there. Utandega somewhere is is busy there. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. This is the end and a big wushi. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thanks for staying us again. Bye. Clinton, good to see you, my brother. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. 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 Goodbye. Goodbye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>